Well, hello once again. This is Pastor Ryan here with North Park Church's 180 lesson. Uh, grateful for you tuning in today. Uh, we are continuing in our series, How to Build Our Endurance for Christ. And we've been looking at Matthew 16, 21 through 24. Uh, <clears throat> today's title of this lesson is Aligning with the Things of God, Aligning Ourselves with the Things of God. Last week we learned uh, that our... Uh, the things of man are a hindrance to God. That's what Jesus says in, the, in our main text. And uh, so we learn how our anger, how man's anger can be a hindrance to the gospel. And we'll review some things today that will be helpful with that. But grab your Bibles and, and let's study together God's word today in Matthew chapter 16, 21 through 24. And learn how we can align ourselves with the things of God rather than the things of man. Matthew 16, 21 through 24 uh, reads, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are a hindrance to me. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We, as God's children, should have a desire inside of us uh, for the things of God. And those things should, uh, that desire should be increasing in us, uh, having a greater desire for the things of God over the things of man and let's just do a little bit of review here last week we talked about man's anger and how man's anger does not produce the righteousness or justice of god right uh, but instead it's a hindrance to the things of god james 1 19 through 21 shows us that and when we have the things of man in mind more than the things of god we become passionate about the things of man we become passionate about our brand of justice, what we want to see happen over the things of God, over the will of God. As a result, we are a stumbling block to the gospel, both to ourselves and to others. What are the things of man specifically that we learned last week? Do you remember what that is? What are the things of man that we specifically talked about last week? Well, remember... Um, Peter is reacting to Jesus in hostility. He's rebuking him in man's anger uh, that does not produce the justice or righteousness of God, right? And Romans 8, 7 tells us the reason for that, uh, the reason for hostility towards God. It's because we have minds set on the flesh, minds set on the flesh. Uh, what does that mean? Well, James 4, 1 tells us that what causes quarrels, what causes fights among you, is it not your passions that war within. There's a war going on within our passions, sinful desires that are at war within us, and they <clears throat> are passionate about the things of man. Now, uh, Matthew 4, 1 through 11, is Jesus' uh, temptation, you know, and uh, we see the things of man that Satan uses to tempt Christ with, to deviate from God's course. In other words, we see Satan use that. And and you see that, uh, let's break it down. Man is more sensitive to the flesh than the spirit of God. Man fights, he quarrels to steer outcomes into satisfying his own passions within. And those passions within are for the things of man in this world, pursuing with passion the things of man. And so what did Satan tempts Jesus with in the desert. It was daily bread, right? Uh, turn these stones into bread. And the things of man are more passionately concerned with securing daily bread rather than living by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And Jesus, uh, after the feeding of the 5,000, people came and looked for him. And Jesus says in John 6, 27, Do not work for the food that perishes, <clears throat> but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Uh, we often don't want to live 
um, relying daily on God to provide, we want to secure that provision for ourselves and not have to rely on God for it. And that's so sinful. That's the things of man taking precedence over the things of God. We're more passionate about daily bread than every word that proceeds from the mouth of Christ. And then the next thing we see in Jesus' temptation is testing rather than trusting. Testing rather than trusting. Remember this, the things of man are more <clears throat> passionately concerned with testing God's love rather than trusting it. <clears throat> when Satan tempted Jesus uh, to publicly throw himself down and have God's angels catch him, God had already demonstrated his public approval of Christ. Remember at Jesus' baptism, Matthew 3.17, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased, do what he says. This temptation was to force God the Father to continue publicly demonstrating his approval of Christ through spectacle and undermining what God had already established. And this happens all the time. Israel tested God again and again despite being miraculously delivered from the hand of Pharaoh, yet they demanded God demonstrate his hand and provision repeatedly. And Hebrews 3, 8, and 9 talks about that. And the religious leaders, remember, they tested Jesus repeatedly demanding a sign. You know, Mark 8, 11 gives an example of that. We must not live. The point is we must not live in insecure love, but trust in God's already demonstrated approval through his cross, through his cross, and rest in it. There is no more spectacular demonstration of God's love than the cross. What are you looking for? Why do you keep testing God? It is this powerful love on display that can cause us to stop testing but trust in the sufficient work of Christ's cross and deny ourselves, trust Christ, take up our cross, right? His cross empowers our cross. The things of man, the third thing, the things of man are more passionate about worldly gain, passionate about worldly gain. Remember, Satan <clears throat> says, if you will worship me, I will give you all the kingdom of the earth for their mind to give. Um, here's the thing, the things of man always have the glory of man in mind over the glory of God. Jesus said, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? John 5:44. It's interesting that after Jesus' description of a follower, you know, one who denies themselves, takes up their cross, and follows me, he says in Matthew 16, 26, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? The things of man involve worldly gain through self-promotion. In order to promote yourself, you have to make a deal with Satan. This world system is under his operation in the world. Satan uh, system runs on his pride, his performance pride, his glory pride. Power and fame uh, create influence. That's the mentality of thinking. Power and fame create influence. But these come by giving something to get something. So your marriage for your dreams, you have to give up a good marriage for your dreams. You have to uh, watch your kids fall apart for your glory. You lose your sanity to gain the wealth you want. Uh, you, have to get, you have to give something to get something from this world system. So the things of man by default worship the things of Satan becoming a hindrance to the gospel, when we blend uh, his system and the gospel uh, to make an impact for God. And you see that all the time in the church, taking Satan's system and the things of God and trying to blend them together to make an impact for God. And that is uh, a hindrance to the gospel. So if we say we know Christ, we must be among those who are absolutely willing to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow Christ on his gospel terms. On his gospel terms, right? We must have our minds set on the things of God rather than the things of man. So we align with the things of God, 
no longer being a hindrance to them. I pray that's your heart's desire. So if that is what you want, I just want to align with the things of God. I don't want to be a hindrance to them anymore. Then you need to understand what those are, right? You need to understand what the things of God, what is meant by the things of God. So um, it's uh, we've got some things here I think can be really helpful to you. Um, what is meant by the things of God? You ready? Here goes. Well, obviously, right off the bat, it's the gospel of God. The things of God means the gospel of God. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 is where we find the gospel. Turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 and 4. Don't just assume you know the gospel. Understand what scripture says. Paul says it this way. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. So in other words, he appeared, uh, his resurrection was confirmed, right? Why is it that when Paul went to Corinth, and he says this in 1 Corinthians 2, that he determined to know nothing else except for Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why did Paul determine that? Well, he tells us in that text so that uh, we would not rely on man's wisdom, but on God's power. On, not on man's wisdom. It's so easy for us to rely on man's wisdom. Whenever we've trained ourselves to be more concerned with our own brand of injustice rather than grieved over our personal injustice towards the kingdom of God, we have trained ourselves, in other words, uh, for a different gospel. Uh, it's our sin, it's our lawlessness towards the kingdom of God that we should be concerned about, our personal sin. And when we're not concerned about that first and foremost, we're a hindrance to the gospel. Uh, first to ourselves and then anyone in our sphere of influence. Uh, it's an amazing thing to me that David, uh, King David commits adultery and murder and when he is repenting and he's and writing the psalm of repentance in Psalm 51, verse 4 says, Against you and you only have I sinned, God, and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be proved right, so that your ways may be proved right. In other words, so that your what you say may be proven true. It's amazing that we don't deal with the gospel reality of our personal sin, what, what our personal sin is. Um, and our bondage to it has done and how we need um, the, the gospel uh, to be a reality in our minds. Second Corinthians 11.4 says, For if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaimed, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. Don't put up with it. You don't want to be a hindrance to uh, the things of God. Don't be a hindrance to the gospel by putting up with a different gospel other than the one you proclaim, or other than the one that Scripture proclaims. Don't put up with it. Scripture says deny yourself. Take up your cross if you're going to follow Jesus. That involves the process of repenting and trusting in Christ and Christ alone, and then going the way, the direction that he would have you take. That begins with his saving work on the cross, that he died, that he was buried, that he was raised. So don't put up with it. Um, we live the gospel so that God may be proved right in what his word says. When we uh, don't have the gospel right and live a different gospel than the one that's proclaimed, uh, we make it look like God's gospel is a lie. Uh, John 3.21 says, But whoever does what is true comes to the light. Why? So that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. That the gospel is at work in the person who's coming into the light and no longer hiding sin but exposing their sin, bringing it to the cross of Jesus Christ. So cry out to God for his mercy and power to believe in his mighty grace for your sin. To know nothing else but Christ and him crucified for your sin. Proclaim that gospel by demonstrating his saving power over your sinful passions. Are you being saved from what 
you are enslaved to within. If you're not, but you say you know Christ, you're proclaiming a different, you're living a different gospel than the one you're proclaiming, right? So Christ died to save sinners. Paul said, of whom I am the foremost. We never lose sight of the fact that we need the saving power of the gospel at work in our lives daily. All right, so number one, that's one of the things that's meant by the things of God. Number two, uh, what is meant by the things of God? The word of God, the word of God. Uh, James 1.22 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. And Jesus tells us in Matthew 4.4, 4, Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Right. So, are you willing to deny yourself and obey God's instruction in his word? Will you look away from your own understanding and feed exclusively on the Word of God, trusting that the Word of God has the final say. So often um, we counsel with people with regard to the Word of God that say something like, I know it's true, the Word of God, I know it's true, but. Oh, I know it's true, but. No buts. That's what's killing your life. No buts. Either God his word has the final say or you do you show how little you fear God in favor of how much you value your own understanding when you say I know God's word says this but no buts you're a hindrance to the word of God both its work in you and its work in your sphere of influence when you say I know that it's true but no Isaiah 66 2 says but this is the one to whom I will look, God says, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Luke 6.46, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Psalm 19.7, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure making wise the simple. Psalm 119, 105 says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So unless the word of God has the final say in our lives, we have no skill for living, no lamp to our feet, no light to our path, to stay in step with God. Instead, we are a hindrance to his ways, reckless and careless with what his word says, with our own understanding having the final say in our lives. And because of that, we do what Proverbs 8, 35, and 36 says, we injure our own lives. We injure our own lives. Uh, the things of God involve the gospel of God. The things of God involve the word of God. And number three, the things of God involve the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 says, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Remember, the mind that's set on the flesh is hostile to God, right? Romans 8, 7. So we need to walk by the Spirit so we will not uh, gratify the desires of the flesh. Uh, if we are staying in step with the Spirit of God... Um, then we are not a hindrance to the things of God. See, Peter didn't understand that Jesus was uh, walking by the Spirit, um, staying in step with the Spirit. And Jesus said, for example, in John 6, 63, it is the Spirit who gives life, and the flesh is no help at all, right? Jesus said these words after a hard teaching that few could receive. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And God's Spirit, we require God's Spirit to understand the Word of God, to understand the Gospel of God. Jesus said um, though, that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And though we might have the desire to do what is right, we do not have the power to carry it out. Only the Spirit can generate the life required to obey God's Word. But, if uh, it, we often... Be honest with yourself. We often rely on our own strength, and that means that we're responding in fear rather than faith. When you rely on your own strength, you respond in fear 
rather than faith. Parenting is always a great example. Um, how we become a hindrance to the things of God by not looking to God's spirit to supply. Let me show you what I mean. We see that our child is thinking wrong or functioning in a way he or she is blind to. Uh, fears begin springing up from our hearts. Fears concerned about the direction of our child and, and where they're heading and what heartache we may experience if this doesn't change, right? And immediately, fear begins to create a diagnosis of the situation. And we just start believing fear's diagnosis rather than slowing down to pray and work out our fears in prayer until we have God's peace, which is a fruit of the Spirit, God's self-control to deal with the situation, right? God's love in it, God's patience in it, all those things. And not until we have God's wisdom, His answers, His solutions. If we don't learn how to start slowing down to the Spirit of God to stay in step with that, we start applying solutions to the problems we see through fear. Applying pressure on our child to produce the result we seek. We may even use God's word in an attempt to do that, but we're not slowing down to a reliance on God's spirit at all. As a result, we may change our child's behavior temporarily, but not make an impact on their heart, which only the spirit of God can do. Do you see that? Do you see what's happening? Both parent and child know that it was for the sake of your scared heart rather than by the power of God's spirit that he or she changed. They changed for you, not for God. And now you become a hindrance to the saving work of God in them by relying on your own fear to produce a result rather than slowing down to the Spirit of God to make an impact in their life. The things of God involve the gospel of God, right? The Word of God, the Spirit of God. And the next thing is the things of God involve the will of God, the will of God, right? Jesus taught us to pray in Matthew 6, 10, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Uh, Jesus said in John 7, 17, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. How do you know if the teaching is from God or if someone's speaking on their own authority? Are you sitting in front of the preaching that we have here at North Park Church, uh, such great preaching, desiring to know the word of God so you can discern the will of God. I want to know what God's word, I want the word preached to me because I've got things in my life that I've been going to God in prayer desiring to discern his will. I want that more than anything else. Um, <clears throat> have you ever thought, I, I just can't hold on to the word of God. I just can't seem to retain it. Well, it's because your greatest ambition is not to know God's will. That's what the text says. You have hearts set on gain, in other words. That's what Ezekiel 33 talks about when people come to listen to Ezekiel's preaching but won't do what it says because their hearts are set on their gain. Have you ever wondered why you can't hold on to the Word of God and apply it? Because you have greater affection for your way than God's way. And we're double-minded in that way. James 1 talks about that. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives it generously without finding fault. But you must not ask. Uh, you must ask in faith and not doubting, because the person who doubts is uh, unstable, double-minded and unstable, tossed to and fro like a wave in the sea. And we must not blend our cause right with the cause of Christ. We often say they're one and the same, but they're really not. They're really not. The reality is we often have our present hurt and our desire for gain in mind, and that takes precedence over the will of God. We often have man's anger and the things of man taking precedence over the will of God. And because of this, 
We miss the words that we need to hear from the preaching of God's word. We miss the authority and power in the word of God that's being preached. Um, there are things that have been studied and prayed upon and the word of God rightly divided and you sit in church and miss it because your greatest ambition is not to know the will of God. Like Peter, you'll hold the will of God in contempt. You'll hate the way things are going in your life. You'll hate the direction that God is, is just calling you to step into. Are you willing to take the narrow way? Are you willing to obey the will of God? Are you willing to deny yourself and begin seeking how God would have you specifically take up your cross? It's not about you. It's about God glorifying himself through you. This can only occur if you're willing to take up your cross and be nailed to it. The person who has endurance for the things of God is the person willing to be nailed to their cross. No longer fighting God to get down off of it. Wants to be on their cross for the sake of God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This indicates a wholehearted desire to discern each step one takes in their life so that they will not become a hindrance to the things of God. The gospel of God, the word of God, the spirit of God, they desire to be in God's will so they're not a hindrance. They're not a stumbling block to their families. They're not a stumbling block to their church. They decide to have their powers of discernment trained with constant practice to distinguish from good and evil. They no longer want to conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of their mind. So they're not a hindrance to God and his people. And that brings us to the next thing, right? The things of God are going to involve the will of God, but they involve the church of God, the church of God. Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right? It is only in the church that we prevail against the spiritual battles that we come up against. In other words, we are being uh, the bride of Christ. We are functioning in a way that we're, we're supposed to be functioning according to God's word as a church. And what does that mean? Uh, well, for example, Hebrews 10, uh, 24 and 25. Um, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting the meat together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day uh, drawing near, the return of Christ drawing near, the time is short, Christ died for the church, there is no church without the sacrifice of Christ, he is returning, and he uh, is returning for those who are his, those who are modeling his way, laying down their life for the sake of the elect, in other words, so what is your present attitude towards the church? Is your life a life that stirs others to good works, prepared in advance for them to walk in as the church? Or like 1 John 2.10 says, Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling, no hindrance. What remains hidden in the dark in your life is a hindrance to the church. You put your church in spiritual hardship the more you conceal your sin instead of reveal it, confess it for what it is, and so that God may be proved right, you live out the gospel, you obey the word of God, you obey the will of God, you obey the spirit of God in your life um, so that you can have the capacity to uh, do the God's will and be the church, be the church of God, functioning together, meeting together, not neglecting that uh, process, but being together as a church. Um, and so is your life one that causes others to stumble, a, a hindrance in the church? Does your attitude reflect love for the body of Christ? Uh, how often do you neglect meeting together by allowing the things of man to take precedence over the things of God? Uh, how often do you do that? How often do you choose escape over coming to church to worship with the body? Listen, when you continually require the things of man to refuel yourself and you have to miss church in order to do so, your mind is set on earthly things. You're a hindrance to the things of God. Matthew 18, 6, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone 
fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. It's a big deal. And speaking of which, is your life a hindrance to the church at home? Because the church at home is the church in miniature. So how healthy is that church? Because that will determine how healthy your church is right now. Listen, anger's passed down. Uh, escapes are passed down. Uh, it's generational, in other words. So we teach it to our kids and give them a stumbling block to the gospel showing them man's escapes. In other words, a greater concern for self over the things of God. Uh, we teach our kids to value what we value. Get a hold of this. Are you willing to deny yourself and value the things of God as greater than your sinful escapes? Or are you going to continue teaching these little ones by your example a careless concern for the things of God? Are you going to keep doing that? Or... Are you going to be the church? Are you going to be aligning with the things of God and be the church? Are you going to be a hindrance to those things? Uh, are you going to repent at home so that you can repent before uh, your church? Listen, you plow the ground at home to receive the preaching at church. If your house is a house filled with escapes and man's anger and strifes, then you have hearts that are unplowed, untilled, and then you expect them to receive something before the preaching of God if you just barely get them here to church. It's impossible. That doesn't make any sense at all. You must no longer be a hindrance to the things of God and be the church. And that starts with the things we've talked about, right? Uh, living the gospel right. Uh, truly living a gospel right, not uh, proclaiming one and living another. Um, you know, truly understanding that it's the Word of God that saves. It's the Spirit of God you need to slow down to. It, you know, it's the will of God that you're saved to accomplish, right? Um, and it's the church of God that you're aligned to. And the last thing that um, involves the things of God is the Christ of God. The Christ of God. Um, Colossians 3, 1 and 2 uh, says, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, the things of God, right? Not on the things on the earth. That's the things of man. So listen, ask yourself, do you live with the raised perspective? Do you live with the victorious view are you willing to confront your own heart with that question? How often uh, do you seek the things that are above, where Christ victoriously sits at the right hand of God, having accomplished everything for salvation, for life and godliness? Is your mind set on the things above like that? Like we learned Sunday, are you even willing to consider if that's so? Uh, we can only suffer uh, and endure for the things we love. That's the only things we can suffer and endure for. How much do you love Christ? How much is your greatest desire Christ? How much do you set your mind on Him, desiring to be with Him, abide in Him? Do you love Him more than the things of man? It starts with Christ. He conquered death and sin. What is conquering you? Uh, it needs to be getting to Christ. He conquered it. Are you bringing your sin to Him? Are you confessing your daily need for His power to work in you? Are you returning again and again to the saving truth of the gospel? That Christ died for my sin. Therefore, I have divine permission to be near to Him. That I have divine permission to access Him, His Word, to abide in the knowledge of His truth. I can look away from myself. I can look away from my sin after I've brought it into the light and look to Jesus. And nothing has to take my eyes off of Him. Christ has won the victory over death, and I can set my mind on the things above. Is your mind set on the reality of this? Um, that I can abide in his promises because of what Christ has accomplished. First Peter 1, 8 and 9, Peter says this, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And as I said, it all starts with the gospel, that Christ died to save sinners, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared to many. Christ died for your sin, for the sake of the elect, 
all those who would put saving faith in Jesus Christ, no longer trusting in themselves and in their power and in their own understanding and um, desiring to go their own way, but denying themselves, taking up their cross and following Christ. I pray that's you. Um, I pray that this is reaching your heart today. And we will finish this, Lord willing, next week talking about how we can begin to walk with joy now and, and through the endurance that God gives us through joy to live um, in the things of God. Uh, we love you, and we'll see you next week.